Hey, what's up, Twins fans, um, 1500 ESPN fans. I am Derek Wetmore. If you don't know, I'm in Fort Myers covering Twins spring training, and I'm just going to host a regular morning coffee Q&A here. I always try to do this on Tuesday mornings. A little bit different week this week with spring training started. I wanted to get a couple of practices, a couple of workouts, and see a couple of bullpens Honestly, uh, before doing this video this week, I wouldn't have had any new information for you, but now I've got a notebook full of it. I need a new notebook. This is, it's getting loaded up too quickly down here. So uh, I'll take any of your questions, anything you've got. Pretty soon here, I think I'm going to turn the camera around because nobody really wants to see me. You probably want to see Hammond Stadium. In fact, I'll just do that right now. Let's see if this works. You'll just have to picture me back here enjoying my coffee in a lonely press box. Uh, flip that around. How's that? Uh, that is the view from the office this morning. You're going to see in about mm, 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes, probably, some Twins pitchers out here. I don't know if they're using the big field today, but if they start to go to the bullpens down there in the left, I can certainly, well, let's just keep it like that. You'll be able to see uh, if, if any Twins pitchers are filing out there. I know there's a handful of bullpens today. Um, I watched a handful yesterday, so uh, I guess I've got some updates. Let me, as uh, as we start this video, let me share the link with our friends on Twitter in case they are not our friends on Facebook. We encourage you to be friends on both, but, you know, sometimes multitasking is difficult. Um, if you have any questions and you're in the lobby, obviously feel free to drop on by and, and just ask me there. I'll get to as many of them as I can today. And as I always do, I'll go back in afterwards in case I missed any, and I'll see any questions that I potentially missed, and I'll, I'll get to those on Facebook with my page. All right, cool. So let me uh, get to a couple of stories that I wrote, uh, and then uh, and then I'll jump into your questions. I see some starting to file in here. <clears throat> so uh, yesterday I wrote a five thoughts column, just kind of like a notebook style thing. I spent the first day of Twins workouts walking around, talking to people, watching batting practice. The catchers were hitting on the field. Uh, watching a couple of bullpens. I'll give you rapid fire of the five thoughts because I see questions starting to fill up the lobby, so I'll I'll uh, make sure I jump over to those. But uh, thought number one, Neil Allen's requiring this uh, new thing with pitchers. It's really pretty elementary. It's not like he's reinventing the wheel, but I thought it was interesting. He's got this edict that says when you start the bullpen, you start with uh, glove side fastballs, and you got to hit three out of the five spots you got to hit the glove three out of five pitches. If you do that, you can move to arm side fastball, same thing. Three out of five, you can move on and throw your breaking stuff and your change-ups. But if you don't hit your spots, you're starting over. So it's basically just a way to emphasize nothing matters until fastball command is locked down. And, I mean, I tend to agree with that approach to pitching. It might be a little too general. There might be some guys who that doesn't really work for. But I have a feeling that it's a good place to start and that uh, you know, if you need to amend it for certain guys, maybe they pitch backwards or or maybe, honestly, they don't thrive off of their fastball. Um, anyway, that's probably too much time talking about that thought. Thought number two was that uh, there's maybe as many as 11 guys in the starting pitching rotation. I'll uh, address questions about that if you guys have any. Um, third thought is that the uh, Twins are still using Gangsta's Paradise. That was just a little bit of a joke. Um, new Twins catcher, Jason Castro, uh, he's, he's not known for his hitting as much. I watched him in the cage the other day. I uh, hit a couple out, obviously, it's batting practice, and these guys are all excellent hitters. Um, he caught Gibson and Hughes. I imagine he'll catch a couple other uh, rotation strong, strong rotation candidates today. And then, let's see, uh, number five, and then we'll jump right to questions. The best nickname in camp, and you cannot convince me otherwise, belongs to Alberto Mejia, who is the big left-handed pitcher that came over from the Giants in the Eduardo Nunez trade. 
Uh, some teammates, I'm told, are calling him El Gato Grande, which is Spanish for the big cat. Uh, other teammates are shortening that one a little bit. Uh, I had one source tell me, listen to me, I sound like a uh, like big baseball insider guy. A source close to the situation told me that some teammates are simply calling Mejia Garfield. Shorter than uh, the big cat, to be sure. So that's easily the best nickname in camp, and uh, I will get to your questions. Thank you for leaving them. Ooh, Mark, looks like you're dominating the feed right now. Uh, Mark says, Derek, does Molitor have a bias against Vargas? It appears he's doing all he can to run him out of here. I don't know why you say that, Mark. If you want to follow up with uh, an explanation, I'd be happy to get into it. But no, I don't think Molitor has a bias against Vargas. In fact, he's probably the odds-on favorite to be the opening day DH. I think as soon as Byung-Ho Park was taken off the roster, it made it pretty clear what they thought about Park. Now what's less clear is what they think about Vargas. Um, I talked to Derek Falvey the other day, and uh, actually another reporter asked him, would you still like to... I, I said, do you, are you still looking at free agents? And Falvey said, yeah, absolutely. And another reporter followed up and said, would you be likely to sp spend money on a bat? Um, and this is me interjecting. Uh, there's several bats out there still. I think Pedro Alvarez. Um, Adam Lind did just sign, but Justin Morneau... Ryan Howard, Billy Butler. It's not like they're great bats, but, you know, if, if Alvarez signed and he faced right-handed hitters, there's another powerful bat. But Falvey said no, probably more likely to go the pitching route. He said, I think he used the word unlikely um, when talking about signing a big bat. So I don't think they're going to bring in competition necessarily for Vargas, and I don't really get the sense that they're trying to run him out. Um, but thank you for the question, Mark. If you want to follow up with why you think that, I'd be happy to address that too. Next question, Adam. Adam asks, uh, any predictions for uh, who you think will be the biggest surprise to make it out of camp? Uh, yeah, I do have a prediction, and it's... I don't know how much of a surprise... I guess it's all relative, right? Like, it depends who you expect to make the team. But I'll pick a non-roster guy. I projected him on my 25-man roster that I published the other day. I just... Totally guessing here on who I think is going to make the team on opening day. But uh, to answer your question, Adam, my probably my biggest surprise on there when I sat from the from the time I sat down to look at the roster to the time I hit publish on that column would be the backup catcher. I think Chris Jimenez has a chance to make the team as a guy who will back up Jason Castro. Obviously, Jimenez not the starter, but. I wouldn't be too shocked, to be honest, if he made the 25-man roster as the backup catcher. Um, that sounds like a bit of a surprise, probably, because he signed a minor league deal and he's not on the roster. He'd need to be added. But uh, if you're looking for, yeah, like kind of a dark horse, uh, non-roster guy, I'd say him. Um, Mark. Um, our catchers can hit, get out. Yeah, I, I mean, you guys might be surprised. I don't know how often you get to games early and watch batting practice, but even guys who you think of as, like, bad hitters can just do some incredible, incredible things in the batting cage. And that's all you see early in spring training. I mean, it's not like he's facing Clayton Kershaw. He's facing, you know, first base coach Jeff Smith grooving fastballs. But still... Uh, one thing that I try to do to uh, to avoid becoming, you know, cynical, because eventually you can just kind of say like, oh yeah, this guy hits 220 in the big leagues, all right, well, he sucks, move on to the next guy. Avoid To avoid that sort of cynicism, I'll go down and I'll watch batting practice as often as I can at Target Field, and I'll see guys like, you know, I don't think Danny Santana's a very good hitter, but even he just gets in the cage, and granted, he's not facing big league pitching, but just everything is on the exact sweet spot of the bat. He just barrels up everything. Um, these guys all have incredible strength and power and hand-eye coordination, so that's kind of what I was talking about with Castro, Mark. Um, pitch location only matters when a pitcher can't top 95. I disagree with you. I think that pitch location is just as important, if not more important in some cases, than velocity. I think you've seen a lot of high-velocity pitchers not have a ton of success success in the big leagues, and so that would seem to go against your argument there. 
Uh, Mark, you say, oh, this is following up on Vargas. Mahler didn't seem to want to use him. Well, I don't think Vargas is that good. I think he's an interesting power threat, but he's not, uh, he's not like locked in to have a good big league career as a DH. I think, I think he's got a shot to be an impact player as a hitter, and I like him from the right side uh, statistically a lot more than from the left. So he makes an interesting platoon possibility with Maurer because he can hit lefties, and Maurer struggled so badly against lefties last year. Um, but I don't know. If I was picking like a percentage on will Vargas be a major impact player in the big leagues, I think, I think I'd say it's probably less than a 50% chance that happens. Um, so no, I don't think Maurer has a bias against him. I think, I think they'll use him. Bill says, uh, Phil Mackey, unblock me. Bill, I'll get right on that. I'll talk to Phil and see what we can do. Da-da-da. Amanda, thanks for dropping by. Molitor said he may be looking at giving Maurer more time off this season. If so, how often should we expect him in the field? Um, that's a really good question. We talked about that on a recent Touch em All podcast, I think I want to say. And my, or, or no, 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 it was, on, uh, it was with Mackey and Judd. Judd asked me, um, you know, how much would you rest Maurer? Uh, excuse me, I'm going to sip some coffee. Um, he said, you know, if you had the lineup card, how how much would you play Joe Maurer? And I think my answer is I'd put him in for 120 games or something like that. He'd face mostly righties um, and play first base. But then on his days off, I don't know that I'd DH him. I think if the Twins are really worried about him breaking down physically at the end of seasons like he did last year, I think you just got to give him the full day off. And I know Twins fans are going to scream about that, but I, I, if I was Molitor, I wouldn't concern myself too much with fans with what fans think of Maurer. I would just try to maximize my chances of winning. And in this case, I think that's having Joe Maurer play first base in two-thirds or a little bit more than that, 70% of the games or something. Um I'd probably try to sit him most often against lefties because he struggled with that so bad last year. But I'm also curious to know if maybe he bounces back from that. I, well, the, the maddening thing about Maurer is that you still see some excellent signs every once in a while. It's just they're becoming more and more fleeting. They're, they're fewer and far between. Whereas now, like, you'll still see a good swing, and it could be like a 12-hopper up the middle that the shortstop was shifted to take away. Or... How many times have you seen him roll over and ground out to second base in the past two, three years? Um, there are a lot of good things still, and that's kind of what's maddening about it, is you never know how often those are going to come out. But a shorter way of answering your question, Amanda, and thank you for dropping by to ask it, is that I think that I could see him being a, more of a part-time player and getting somebody else out at first base uh, you know, 25% of the time. Ben asks... Who do you hope makes the team but is unlikely to? Uh, that's a tough question for me to answer because because I don't... This is going to sound callous or mean. I don't mean it to sound like this. But, like, I don't really care who makes the team. <laughs> I, I mean, my job is to be an analyst and I try to sit back as objectively as possible. I mean, sure, there are guys in the clubhouse who are really nice and who... Um, who I enjoy talking with, but, like, my job is to do this no matter who makes the team and no matter how good or bad the Twins are. So, like, I think I just come at it from a little different perspective. But I guess, Ben, to maybe... Let me phrase it a, just a little bit differently, and hopefully this will be a good answer. Um, there are some guys that I currently don't have projected in my opening day 25-man roster that I like talking to, that are, that are fun uh, to, to talk about baseball with and who, are, who have a good head for the game or just a good, um, good way of seeing things that I like to talk to. And two of those guys are Tyler Duffy and J.O. Barrales. I think both of those guys start the season in either AAA Rochester or in Duffy's case, I could even see him being a reliever in 2017. Um, so maybe he will make the team, but who knows? Um, long way of answering your question, maybe Ben, but those are two guys that, you know, I, I, I like talking with and I don't currently have projected in my opening day roster. 
Um, well, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it like that before. Let's see. Bob, you got a question. Bobo. Uh, can you explain what the thought process is to not bringing in a guy like Jake Peavy to help mentor the young pitchers? Um, yes, uh, Bob. The thought behind guys like uh, let me let me address this in reverse order. Uh, the Twins have brought in guys to sort of mentor young pitchers, and Latroy Hawkins is Exhibit A. He's out there as kind of like an extra coach right now, and I think it's a stroke of genius to hire people like that. If they're really invested, if they're really committed to being sort of that next, taking that next step in their career, I think Hawkins, if he wants to be, will be a bullpen coach or a pitching coach like as early as next year. But I think for right now, he's just a really good liaison of somebody who understands the coaching side of the game because he played for so long and he's connected with so many managers and coaches but also is close enough to the players. I mean, he was pitching against them, you know, very recently. So they have respect for him that that he was still in the game, and it's not like he's been out of baseball for 20 years. Um, Latroy Hawkins is a good example of that. Other pitchers, like Irvin Santana, is an example of that. He's a good example for young pitchers. I talked to him yesterday. I said, do you feel like it's your job to kind of mentor some of the younger guys? Just It was a bigger conversation about pitching, but that was one of my questions. He said, no, not at all. I was a little surprised by his answer, but then he explained, I don't view it as a job. It's, he said it's kind of more like a duty. Like young, young, When he was a young Irvin Santana, he named five pitchers who were constantly helping him out and pitching coaches who helped him find his way in the big leagues. And so he almost views it as like a right uh, to, to turn around and do that for younger guys, like whether it's Barreos or, or anybody else. Um, so Santana's in that mix. I think, um, well, Matt Belisle is a reliever who's in that mix as, as a veteran guy to show people how, how to go about their business. I, I don't know that it really makes a lot of sense to just overload the roster, especially if you don't think a guy can get people out. So I don't want to make this sound like I am anti-Jake Peavy. I'd actually have to look into his numbers to figure out, uh, to figure out your interest there. But... In terms of mentoring, I actually think the Twins are doing better at that this year than they have in years past. Christy, do you think that Falvey is setting the tone that Molitor should have set from the start last year? Um, no, I don't think Falvey's really a tone setter. I think Falvey's a really smart guy who's also very personable and will have, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one contact with a lot of people. But not it's not like he's talking to players uh, all the time. They're going to sit down and have a five-minute meeting with, with everybody in camp and say, what are your expectations? You know, maybe ask them some questions, but probably more likely uh, just tell them, hey, this is where we see you. We think you are whatever. You, you're one of the ten best starting pitchers in camp, and you've got a shot to make the rotation. Or we think you are going to start as a starting pitcher in training camp, but if nobody gets hurt, probably see you moving to the bullpen. They're going to have those conversations with players here over the next couple days, um, and then as position players report. But I don't view it really as like a rah-rah mentality. In fact, I'm told that Falvey's not going to make a big speech. He's not going to address the team and say, you know, let's put last year behind us, all that stuff. That's going to be left up to Molitor. And I was watching Molitor do some drills with his pitchers yesterday. And this is just one day, so you never know. But he seemed like he was a lot more vocal. In the past, I've seen Molitor as kind of a passive observer. He, he just kind of likes to take in information and, and watch, uh, I don't know, watch the situation unfold. Yesterday, he was really kind of more vocal and, and adamant. Um, so I guess I don't know if that's a good way to answer your question, Christy, but that's the way I kind of see it. We've got uh, some action down in the bullpen, so share this with you here. I don't know if you guys let me know if you want to see if you'd rather see me talking into the camera. But I figured it was appropriate today to uh, to have um, the the camera focused on the field because that's probably more likely what you came to see. Um, it looks like they're just going to get stretched out here. Bullpens probably won't start for a little while, but that means I'll have to get down there kind of soon, folks. I'll check the uh, time. But uh, that is the day job. Um, I do have another question in here, Ben. Um, so I'll get to that. But if no more come in, 
Uh, oh, Christy coming down March. Good. Good to see. Uh, stop by, say hi if you see me. I ran into a Twins fan from Minnesota yesterday. So it was fun to talk to them. Um, but uh, let me let me check the time here on my watch, aka laptop. Yeah, I've got a couple of minutes um, only. So Ben, your question is: Who's going to be the fourth and fifth starters? Great question, and it's impossible to answer right now. Let me say this before I give you my actual projection. And it is that we all like to pretend that we have the answers. We all would love to say, I know what's going to happen this year. I know who's going to be on the roster. But I think that we'd all be better off if we just admit that there are a lot of things that we don't know and that we're, we're just kind of making educated guesses a lot of times. I think even Derek Falvey and Thad Levine would be willing to say that, um, you know, we don't know exactly who's going to make the team. They know who they, how they, what they think of everybody, and they know that they'll watch spring training and maybe update their assessment of people, but they don't know who's going to make the opening day 25-man roster. Uh, so if they don't know, I sure as heck don't know, but I do have some guesses, and Ben, that's probably what you were looking for. You were looking for my guesses, not my uh, absolute definitive answer. Um, Molitor told us yesterday that he's very open-minded about the back end of the rotation. And I think that probably means three, four, and five. I mean, I'm putting Irvin Santana and Phil Hughes in there. But then, you know, if you say Hector Santiago and Kyle Gibson are locks, well, suddenly you've got like six pitchers, seven pitchers trying to compete for only one rotation opening. So I think they're probably going to try to keep that open-ended as long as possible. But for me, those are the fourth and fifth starters. It's Kyle Gibson and Hector Santiago. Uh, the fifth guy, which I have not mentioned yet, is Trevor May. I would move May into the rotation, and I think he's definitely one of their five best starters. Um, guys waiting in the wings then, obviously Boreos would probably be first on that list. Tyler Duffy had some success two years ago and stumbled a lot last year. Um, he's looking for a rebound season. Uh, let's see, who else is in that mix? Ryan Vogelsong, I talked to him today. He understands his role in this spring training is to try to come in and make a team. He says he'll try to be as ready as possible, unlike most years where you might just work your way to be ready for opening day. Um, he's going to really hit it hard here early. Um, who else? Nick Tepish is in that mix. Justin Haley, the Rule 5 pick, is in that mix. Um, I don't know if I'm forgetting anybody. I do have a I do have a list jotted down here. Um, here I found it on this page. Oh, I'm forgetting the best nickname in camp. He's definitely in the mix. That's that's probably your dark horse rotation candidate is Alberto Mejia, who if uh, if you didn't tune in at the beginning of this video has easily the best nickname in camp. It's El Gato Grande, or some teammates have just shortened that the big cat nickname to Garfield. Uh, so I'm hoping that one sticks. I asked him about it just to make sure it wasn't like offensive or that he'd be he'd be mad if I if I went with that publicly and he just kind of laughed at it and he said, "No, I don't know why they call me that, but it's funny." So um, that's it. Nope, one more question. I'll get to this. How can Hughes be a lock? He was awful last year. Right. But Hughes is making 13.2 million dollars or whatever it is. Uh, I think he's as close to a lock as you can get, and he's hoping for, for a bounce back from health. I will, uh, I will say that, for, in my opinion, as a stats guy, John, it's a good question. I appreciate you uh, keeping me honest there, John. Um, but with Phil, it's like I think his all of his struggles can basically be attributed last year to the injury that he got shoulder surgery to correct. I, People will say, I'm giving him too much of a pass. I don't think so. If you watched his fastball in March and April, it wasn't even close to the fastball that he had in 2014 when he dominated. He lost like a mile or two. And more importantly, I don't think he was locating it as well. And then the fastball for Hughes sets up that cut. And when he doesn't have either of those, it's just going to be a long day. And he's just trying to get through with his diminished stuff. And he's going to be a five and dive guy. But... For me, if he's healthy, if he's got the fastball back, and I talked to him yesterday, he feels as good as he has at the beginning of spring training. So um, I'm not, I'm not like betting on him having a great year. But what else would you do uh, if if Hughes doesn't make the rotation? Would you make him a one inning reliever? I, I'm not sure. I look, 
I look for him to probably make the rotation, and we'll uh, we'll see what happens uh, the rest of spring, though. Um, Nick, I'm sorry, I gotta jump out of here. I see your question on Sano. Um, to answer it quickly, and I can maybe answer it on Facebook later on my page. Oh, by the way, if you're not following my page, go check that out. It's Derek Wetmore MLB, and I've got Twins Talk on there all the time. I mean, I post all my stuff there, and lots of uh, lots of fun conversation going on there 24-7. But Nick, the Sano experiment, a third done yet? No way. They're going to take 2017 to figure out if he can be a third baseman long term. Um, Jason says he's in Arizona. <laughs> Cubs. Well, the Cubs did win the World Series, so that wouldn't be a bad place to be either. Um, anyways, that's it for me. I'm going to go finish my coffee and go take some notes on Twins bullpens after I get the sunscreen on. Um, thank you for stopping by, and uh, let's see. I'll wave you all goodbye. We'll see you next time. I'll have a couple more videos from spring training. Um, check my Facebook page out, and we'll have plenty of Twins coverage there throughout spring training at Fort Myers. Um, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'm Derek Wetmore. We'll catch you later.